Tony, what the, <clears throat> I know Cal's talked a lot about trying to figure it out with Jared how he can be effective offensively, where he's comfortable. I know there's a lot of just shaking off rust that comes with that for him, but are there specific things you guys can do or have been doing them to try to get him comfortable again? Yeah, you, you don't miss as much time as he missed, and there not be some unfamiliarity between him, the team, us, and the staff, and him, and trying to figure out you know, his strengths, his weaknesses, where we can plug him in this far along in the season, and that's just going to be a work in progress. And Every game you see him getting more and more comfortable. The game is starting to really slow down for him. You, those first uh, couple of games, uh, I think the game was going about a million miles an hour for Jared. When you watched him had the ball in his hands, he was flying. Um, so everything he's doing right now defensively, he's getting more comfortable with our concepts, how we want uh, our defense to look in the position that he's playing. He's getting more comfortable in the offense. But every day it's going to be a work in progress trying to figure out how we insert him how he helps his team going forward. But one of the things you see with him is he's the type of player that doesn't necessarily need to have his hands on the ball to impact the game. And those guys are invaluable in any team kind of system or program. I mean, he can defend, he can block shots. He's shown he's an elite rebounder. Um, not just balls are in, 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 his, in his area, but out of his area as well. So he's been a huge boost to the team uh, here more than halfway through the season. And we anticipate him continuing to get more comfortable and helping us even more. Do you see this team pick it up a notch a little bit when he does take to the floor because he brings such a different dynamic? Yeah, his energy is incredible. You know, again, he's a guy that, who doesn't need the ball to impact the game, and when he does have the ball in, in his hands, he can impact the game as well because he doesn't need to shoot it to and score to impact it. He's a great passer. He's got a great feel for the game, um, but a lot like Winion, playing hard and energy levels and output is also a skill. And it's one of his, his strengths and his skill level is how hard he plays, how hard he, he competes. That, that becomes contagious. You guys have posted him up some, Tony. It seems like it looks like you're still trying to figure out where on the floor he, he's comfortable, where. Are, are any leads in mind at this point of where it looks like uh, he could be developed? Well, well, with Jared's skill package, he's comfortable anywhere on the floor. I mean, you know, before. Knock on wood, the, the injury um, in the preseason, he played everywhere from point guard to center and everywhere in between. I mean, he handles the ball like a point guard. He visually sees the game like a point guard. He just happens to be 6'10, 240, 45 pounds, whatever that is. And that, you look at, you know, you project him out as a Lamar Odom type, a, a Ben Simmons type, a, a 6'10 left handed guy who has, was multifaceted in his skill level. And uh, the guys like that, you can use him to your advantage in any offense. You can put him on the ball, ball, let him be the point. You can post him up if they put a small on him. Um, and if they have bigs on him, you can put him in pick and rolls where he's handling the ball. Or he could be the pick and pop guy in a ball screen. So his versatility has is, is done nothing but, but boost our team and add to it. Probably eight of the last nine games are against teams that are projected either in the field or right on the bubble. How does that prepare you guys for postseason play in a way that maybe last year when there weren't that many teams? Well, I think it just has to do with our overall schedule. From, from start to where we're at at this point, how we finished. I mean, every year when Coach Cal builds a schedule, that's what it's built around, preparing his teams for March. And that's why historically you've seen his teams be one of the hottest late in the season, late in conference play, going into conference tournaments, and then on into postseason NCAA tournament time. That's the reason why, because of the strength of the schedule. And then when you look at the SEC, this year is one of the, the strongest years that it's had uh, in a long time. It's only going to help boost uh, not only our team, but all teams that are chasing the postseason. Tony, does, does Conzo's team at Missouri look like his teams at Tennessee? Or are they any different than that in their no. style of play and how they play? Yeah, I mean, we've all been coaching um, against his teams forever. And they all have um, one very persistent um, trait, and that's how tough they play, how tough physically, how tough they are mentally. They're not going to beat themselves. Uh, they're going to try to beat you up. Physically, and, and when you watch him on tape, that's what you see. That's what you saw at Tennessee with his teams, and that's what you see at Missouri with his teams. How good was Michael Porter to me? And as a basketball guy, how much empathy do you feel for somebody that can't play? Oh, a lot of empathy. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a special, unique talent. And, uh, you know, as a coach and as a player, you always want to measure yourself against the best. So it's unfortunate that he's out and we wish him a speedy recovery and get back healthy and whether that's this year or you know next year in the in the NBA, you know, we want to see him back at full strength because as a fan of the game, 
you enjoy watching players like like Michael. Um, so, but the team, their team is is mulling around the pieces they got. They're one of the most talented teams in this league. Don't let their record fool you. I mean, they've had some great wins out of conference. They've had some great wins in the conference, going to Alabama in their last game and winning. You know, beating Tennessee, beating Georgia, beating South Carolina. I mean, this team is this team is as good top to bottom as any team in this league, and they present a lot of different challenges for us. Tony, are you doing more practice coaching because of all the zone you guys are playing this year? Um, I think we, as assistants, we all fill our role and whatever that is as the kind of pseudo defensive coordinator. It's just not about zone for me. Um, you know, I'm very intricately involved in man-to-man -man defense and how we played and the concepts there. And, um, obviously, Cal has a final say on anything we do, but you know, with my background playing the zone, that's what kind of everybody identifies um, with me with this team. But it's not just the, the zone. You know, I'm involved in the man-to-man -man defense as well. A couple of weeks ago, Cal, PJ had a good game. Cal said, "You can't go back. You are. You need to grab that leadership role." Then he stumbles a little bit. Does this team have a guy that they turn to to kind of lead them? Is it Shea after what he can do? You know what, Cal's never been a guy where he's he's necessarily looked for one guy to lead his teams. Because if that one guy's not going, guess what? Who are you turning to? So he wants a team full of leaders. And that's what I think you see with this team. Like you've seen historically, look at last year's team. One one day, one game Isaiah Briscoe led us. The next day it was Bam. The next day it was De'Aaron. The next day it was Malik. That's what's happening with this team. The benefit that this team doesn't have, like some of the recent ones that Cal's had here, is we don't have those vet veteran presidents. I mean, the Maliks, the De'Aaron's, the Bams, those guys struggled. If we, we all remember that run late in the year when we were one of the best teams in the country, but those first 25 was a struggle with, with those young guys. But they were able to lean on Dom, Derek, Michael Mulder, Isaiah, Isaac. Those, those guys were veteran players that those young guys could lead, could watch, and could learn from. And, and, and every day, if they weren't there, those veteran guys were there to carry you. Well, this team didn't have that benefit. And like typical freshmen, just like last year's freshman and the freshman before that, it's going to be a roller coaster ride. It's up and it's down. And one day they're at their peak. PJ a few games ago, as you referenced, and in the last couple of games he struggled. But those are typical freshmen who don't have the benefit of, of having those those veterans to lean on. So now it's trial by fire for those guys, and I think they're progressing about the pace that, that normal freshmen progress. Late January, early February, is when you see those guys. Now they really are no longer freshmen. And that's the transition that they've been going through all year long. Is it important that, that you've seen several of the guys, almost most of the guys on this team, they'll have a moment where you, you've got a glimpse of what they can be over the course of the year and as you try to build towards them all playing to that? Absolutely, there's no question. I mean, we, we've talked about that as a staff. And again, you just, you know, keep, you go back to freshmen. They're freshmen for a reason um, because they're learning. They're, you know, none of them have ever played on this level, so it's a learning process this entire season. And now as you get into this time of the year, mid-conference play, late January, early February, is where you see your freshmen kind of turn into veterans. And then there's no more excuses, and we don't accept excuses anyway. But that's the process that these freshmen are going through, um, seeing multiple different type of defenses on them individually and us as a team that they've never seen before and learning those things. And now they see a defense similar to that the next time. They're more comfortable uh, in that way. And, and what a team tries to do against you offensively is so many different styles of offense that we're trying to defend with freshmen who have never seen that before. Um, again, you had those veterans that they could lean on and carry you through those tough moments. And then when they grew up, we became one of the best teams in the country and one that had a chance to win a national title um, last year and the year before and the year before and the year before. And this team is no different. It's just that they don't have the benefit of those veterans to lean on. Nick mentioned watching them by himself with you and Coach Campaign. And he said specifically you guys are looking at like some body language stuff. What are you trying to improve in that aspect of this game? A typical freshman. You know, they, they wear their frustration on their sleeve. Um, frustration with whether they're playing or whatever the case may be, whether they miss a shot. They let that affect their next play. It's just typical freshman stuff that we're dealing with in terms of the body language. And it's, it's what we emphasize about the growing up process, the maturation process that whether you miss a defensive assignment and coach is on you, um, whether you get a shot that you think you should have made but you don't make it, they tend to show that that frustration or them being disappointed in themselves on their sleeve, which leads to the perception of bad body language. But it's not bad body language. They're just disappointed that they let themselves down or their team down. We're trying to get them to move on to the next play, move on to the next play, move on to the next play. That's what that veteran process is that veteran leadership that we talk about that we don't have, that they haven't had the benefit of watching a guy in front of them move on. 
So we've had to show not only Nick, but all of our freshmen on tape, here you missed that assignment. Look how you let it impact your next two plays in a negative way. So that's some of the stuff that we try to do tape wise, tape work with our guys to help them grow up. Do you hold more guys? Do you hold Jared up then a little bit as an example of look this guy on one end, you know, throws the ball off the shot clock, <laughs> and on the other end he's you know grabbing rebound. You know what I mean? Like it seems like he's not letting struggles in one area really affect the rest of his game because he has no idea what he's doing out there. So he, doesn't, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know what to hang, hang on to. Um, he just moves on to the next play because he's, he's just out there trying to figure things out on the run. But it is a great example to watch Jared just kind of play as hard as he possibly can every possession until he dies. Then we get him out of the, out of the game. Um, but no, Jared's, Jared's been great. He's only getting better. Tony, has there been a thread to the way you got behind the West Virginia and Vanderbilt, a common thread to that? And is there a common thread to the way you've come back in both games? Well, the common thread that we like is how we've come back. Now, we don't want to constantly dig ourselves holes, especially against the good teams that we've we played. Uh, is there a common thread? I don't know. I mean, like this, both teams are so different in their styles. One, a pressing, uh, forced the pace, West Virginia. Um, the other one was very deliberate, packed it in, sagged on our, on our off against our offense, and moved the ball a ton offensively against our defense. So they were both different. The one thing you've got to say is, we like the resilience of this team. They don't hang their heads when they get down. They collectively fight together to get back in the game. Now we got to figure out how we bottle that up and get us to, to start the game that way. But I think it was more, it had to do with styles of teams that we played as opposed to what this team's not doing. All right, thanks, folks.